So the first innovation I thought we would say is there are more surgeons interested in tower uh, compared to cardiologists. So that is <clears throat> one of the most important uh, thing that has happened over time. And we are very happy and proud of it. So uh, that is uh, a very important innovation. I'm not going to talk about that. So initially, I thought that maybe when I have to say five innovations, maybe I should I talk about patient population, new valves, new accesses for closure devices, new CMS guidelines, new AUC guidelines. And I thought that it would be all extremely boring if I talked about all of these things, uh, because those are things that are not really innovation. They are processes that are happening over time. So what I thought is that what I'm doing differently in last one year compared to the year before that and in my tower practice, and that I would consider as an innovation that at least people can take home and say that maybe this is something worth considering. So this is how I structured my top five things. So they may not sound very novel, but there are some learning points for each of them. So first thing I put number five, going backwards, uh, to say that uh, we like to do a high pressure valve in valve uh, expansion because now valve in valve is a very acceptable uh, option for all patients. I, I would say that even for patients who are good surgical candidates, you could consider uh, a valve in valve. And Dr. Turju, Michael Mack, and a lot of people here uh, contributed to this paper to say that if you look at the TVT registry, it is very clear that if you, if you match native valve tower to valve in valve tower, valve in valve tower is extremely safe compared to native valve tower. And native valve tower, as you know, is extremely safe. So if you combine these two, it makes sense that valve in valve tower. So what about the small valves? And I just want to show you a case and then just describe. So this is a important uh, slide that we make for all our patients for tower. So whenever we have a patient, this is our pre-cath or pre-tower workup, that the fellows make a slide where there is a clinical history, labs, imaging, cath, access, and then we say what are the procedural issues. Because all of these patients look very same, they're very old, very frail, a lot of comorbidities, and they run into each other. So unless we have a very clear slide, and this is projected in our cath lab in one of the monitors. So this is part of our slide. So this is a patient who has, the claim has a 23 uh, mosaic valve. And if you look up the valve in valve app, it will say that you can put uh, a, either a 23 uh, self-expanding valve or a, uh, they even say that you can put a smaller uh, balloon expandable valve. Here we decided to put a 23 S3 valve uh, inside of the mosaic valve. And as you can see that there is a waste and if you measure the hemodynamics, as you can see on the right side, hemodynamics doesn't look too bad. But this is not good, because if you see that the aortic pressure is way different from the, from the LV pressure, and if you are going to measure the instantaneous gradient, it's going to be high. So this is not an adequate result. So that's the first step to know. And doing an echo is not enough. Doing an invasive hemodynamics takes two more minutes uh, to check the pressure is worthwhile. So what is, this, what is the option? So the option is to put a high pressure balloon. So if you see here, so if you put, we put a 22 millimeter true balloon and expand it to 18 atmospheres. Uh, and if you expand it to it, there is some data to say that the valve in vitro, if you over expand it, it tears. But this is not over expanding. This is a 23 valve and we're putting 22 balloon. And if you see at the end of this, so these are the two pictures, still frames, before and after. And you can see that the valve expands very visibly and fairly large. And if you measure the gradient below, you see that the upslope of the aortic valve is parallel to the uh, LV pressure. So there is no instantaneous gradient. Not just peak-to-peak -peak gradient, but there is no instantaneous gradient. And how do we do that? So this is a simple thing to keep in mind, that if you use a in-deflator, put the in-deflator on the closed end and keep the pressure up. So you don't have to take time. So I usually put the indeflator to 12 to 14. We published it in CCI, so this video is there. But the idea is that the stopcock is closed. You inflate the indeflator, keep the indeflator at high pressure. So when you are inflating the balloon with the big syringe, and if you flip, you already have six or eight or 10 pressure inside, 
you can go to 18. Otherwise, if you try to turn it, it will take forever. Patient may have a seizure. So this is the, uh, this is okay. You know, I, I tell our anesthesiologists that seizure is part of TAVR. So if sometimes they seize a little bit, it, they will come back. The internal pacemaker for rapid pacing. Very simple concept that, you know, we have a pacemaker in the patient. Why do we put a temporary wire? You just use the internal pacemaker. Not enough data to say that this is safe, reproducible. So we looked at all our different kind of pacemaker. We again put it as a publication, so hopefully it will be published soon. But the idea is that in whatever number of patients we looked at, we were completely safe to use the internal pacemaker. So we no longer put a temporary wire in the patients who have internal pacemaker. Sentinel device. Sentinel device now, as you know, is uh, now bought by Boston Scientific. Uh, and uh, as some of you know, that there are two uh, filters, one in the nominate, one in the carotid. And on the right-hand screen, this is a live fluoro of, to say that how long it takes while I'm talking. So there are two, this is, goes through a six French radial catheter, uh, and it goes from the radial artery. Uh, here, this is the nominate filter that we are deploying. And then you slowly pull back this. I use whisper wire. Some people use the BHW wire. Uh, I think whisper is better. Uh, because it's softer, so it lets it turn better. So now you just pull back this distal part, uh, this little piece, uh, back into the aorta. And now we are pulling back the distal piece. And just flex it. It looks towards the carotid. It will look towards the carotid. You can flex it a little bit more. There is a dial there. And then you just advance the small wire, in this case the whisper wire, which is inside of it, right there. So the whisper wire goes into the carotid artery. You have to manipulate it a little bit uh, to align it to the carotid artery. Uh, gently, there is no rush. Uh, and once you put the wire in the carotid artery, uh, you can advance as the wire is now in the carotid artery. Maybe you cannot see in the back. You pull back the device uh, and slowly advance the distal filter. You will see the distal filter coming out in a second. Uh, and that is the end of the procedure. So this takes literally that much time, which is less than a minute. Uh, to put it, maybe you can say three, four minutes in the trial, uh, but it doesn't take four minutes. Uh, and the data, the reason why it got approved by the FDA was we presented it very candidly that we had the primary endpoint not right because we say lesion volume, and lesion volume patients don't care about lesion volume, they care about stroke. And the strokes were much reduced, 63% in this particular slide, at 72 hours, 72 hours. So there is a clinical benefit, and now a lot of retrospective data showing. And in our case, we did 265. I wrote a letter to a Medicare to say that we should have reimbursement, because all these 265 patients that we used last year, we didn't have a single stroke. Same groin access. So I stopped doing two groins. There is no need to put a two groin access, crossover, and all this. It's too much. So just go in one groin, inject the dye, just stick below. I don't even inject dye or anything. Just stick a few, few centimeters below, maybe in the common SFA or profunda, doesn't matter, or SF, wherever, because you are going to hold pressure. And at the end of the procedure, you just remove the big sheath and you check the, from the below sheath if the groin is good or not. If it's not good, put a five, six, seven millimeter balloon, dilate it. So you can just put it from the sheath, balloon dilated. So there's no need for crossover wire. There's no need for, and one groin. So next day morning, you just check one groin. You don't have to check two groins. And patient feel good because they didn't have both groins instrumented. So this is uh, our standard now. So here you can see two groins. And I use one per close, no two per closes, just one per close. At the end of the per close, if it bleeds, no big deal, I put an angio So this is another very important advance that Two perclosis sometimes pinches the artery. So if you just put one perclose, and if it bleeds, put uh, angiosil on the top so it doesn't bleed. So it is two-way closure, one stitch and one uh, collagen. And here you can see that, you know, because you have a wire there, you can just put an angiosil. The hole is never bigger than eight. If it is bigger than eight, if you think it's a lot of bleeding, then of course you use your judgment how you deal with it. Sometimes you can put more than one uh, angiosil. And the last one, I say, I didn't put it there, but it should be the accurate placement of the aortic valve. What is an accurate placement? So most people put the valve in an LAO projection. Uh, self, I'm talking about the balloon expandable valve. 
So they, most of the people put it in the, and they use a pigtail catheter. So first thing we did is that don't use pigtail catheter, we use a straight flush catheter, straight. So you put it straight into the bottom of the non coronary cusp. So now the catheter is in the bottom of the non coronary cusp, and you are now checking the RAO caudal view. As you know that the aortic plane can be checked in RAO to LAO, whatever, whatever view. Why RAO view? So here you can see we are deploying the valve exactly at the native annulus. So the last link of the valve is at the last link. And how can you accomplish that? How can you accomplish that is very simple. Is that if you look at the, you align like how you align a metronic valve uh, with the rings, you can align the S3 valve so that you are squared. When you are squared, you see the link. You see the bottom link. You see that white line uh, of the stent. So you can see this, this white line to say that this is the link. If you line up the link, this is how much it foreshortens. So it's just lucky that it foreshortens exactly the size of the link. So if you are going to not underinflate it, it will foreshorten exactly the size of the link. So you can just take the link, place it there, and inflate. So very, very simple. Why it is so important is, of course, that there is a conduction system, and you want to seal the interleaflet area. You don't really need to seal the mitral valve. So if you have a cuff there, it is not as good, because the, what are you going to seal there? So the, it is better to seal where you have the intercommissures. And that is what I show in there, that where the seal is and when our valve is, uh, that it will seal properly. If you look at the LAO view, because we have a biplane lab, so same patient, you have an LAO view, you will see that you will feel uncomfortable, that this is the valve that is almost outside. That you know, the valve is, it looks like it is outside. And if you look at uh, the LAO, the RAO view, you will see that the non coronary cusp is a little bit lower. All the surgeons will tell you that non coronary cusp is a little deeper than the right and the, uh, right and the left. And so that's why to see the non coronary cusp is the most important part of the catheter. And here, if you look at the post implant depth, see in the LAO view, you feel uncomfortable that this is all awfully high. It is not. And if you look at the CAT scan of the patient, if you bring the patient back to the CAT scan, and you will see on the upper corner, right there, that the valve is just below the right coronary cusp, right at the non coronary cusp. So it always sits like that too. So that's why I think that putting a valve in an RAO projection uh, is a helpful technique to be very, very precise. And so, uh, for example, last year we did 500. We did not have a single embolization or anything like that. And uh, our pacemaker rate is less than 5% with the S3 valve. So, and we had four patients with a AR and uh, with which was graded as two plus. This is the patient that I just showed you. This is the echocardiogram, and there is no aortic regurgitation. Finally, the top secret, I said, is that the procedural log. So we don't publish this anywhere because we don't want less reimbursement. We start at 8.47, finish at 9.15. We put sentinel device, this thing, that thing, close the groin. So 26 minutes, and we are not rushing. So. There is, this is a simple procedure. This is not a difficult procedure. And very reproducible. Planning is everything. So people ask me, say that, show us a difficult case. There's no difficult case. Because if you had a difficult case, you plan differently so that it doesn't become difficult. So that is the, the beauty of tower. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. That was a wonderful, uh, lots of provocative uh, uh, suggestions there. So uh, our next speaker, we'll move on. We'll have a panel at the end. Uh, we'll move on. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Mack, who you all know uh, is going to be speaking on top five latest innovations in surgery. So, uh, Paul, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. Congratulations on a great meeting. Uh, and I think thank you for asking me to give this talk uh, following Samir. Innovation in an aortic valve therapy, top five latest innovations that are not TAVR. 
So that was difficult in enough in itself. And then a couple weeks ago, Paul reached out to me and said, oh, by the way, can you give another talk on the same subject? <laughs> New aortic valve innovations you don't know about. So um, this is my conflict of interest disclosure. So what I'm going to do is to divide surgical innovations into two seven-minute talks. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three innovations uh, that are not TAVR. Uh, uh, in aortic valve uh, and ascending aortic uh, surgery. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is sutureless aortic valves and then the concept of enhanced tissue preservation uh, and then thirdly uh, aortic annuloplasty rings. So there are two uh, uh, sutureless surgical valves on the market. One is the Edwards Intuity valve that you see on the left and the second is the Levanova Percival valve uh, on the right. So why a sutureless valve? It's kind of a hybrid between TABR uh, and a surgical valve. Um, it's, uh, the idea is that if you don't have to suture the valve in, then you can, number one, shorten the amount of time that you're on cardiopulmonary bypass and have an ischemic arrested heart Secondly, you can facilitate minimally invasive surgical aortic valve replacement because the most technically difficult part of going through a small incision is the suturing. And if you can eliminate that, uh, then you can facilitate more minimal access surgery. And the third is, because you don't have the sewing ring and cuff on it, you can get larger EOAs, uh, especially in small aortic roots, so that the uh, orifice areas are closer to TAVR than traditional surgical valves. So here's a patient with uh, a minimally invasive surgical uh, aortic valve replacement, and these are done either through a partial upper sternotomy or a right anterior thoracotomy. So this is the Edwards uh, Intuity valve. It's uh, uh, like the surgical valve, it's bovine pericardium that's thermofixed. Uh, and it has a balloon expandable stain, uh, stainless steel frame on the bottom and it's got a polyester sealing cloth on it. There is a balloon delivery system that uh, once the valve has been placed in the aortic annulus, balloon expansion occurs. And you can see in the upper right corner uh, what it looks like in the undeployed versus the deployed position. So this is a, um, this is a animation on the left and uh, a surgical procedure on the right uh, that shows the concept here. There's three stay sutures that are, uh, that are placed uh, to anchor it in the, in the proper position because it's difficult to exactly see where you are. Uh, and then once it's in position, the, en the endoflator uh, <coughs> is inflated and uh, the balloon expansion occurs. So you can see on the right, uh, the, the um, uh, valve has been opened uh, and uh, valve excised. Uh, and then the valve is put into place. For some reason, it's not going to that. The second valve uh, is a little bit different, uh, and it's the Percival valve by initially Soren, now Levanova. Uh, and it's got a interesting stent design that uh, part, uh, the lower stent is anchored in the aortic annulus, and the upper stent is anchored uh, just above the sinotubular junction. Uh, and between those, there's access to the coronary arteries. Uh, and this is looking at the um, uh, mean gradient and uh, EOAs uh, of the Percival valve compared to um, uh, standard surgical valves. And you can see that the mean gradients uh, are lower, more in the range of TAVR. The second concept uh, is enhanced tissue preservation. Uh, now, what does that mean? So this is the uh, new valve from Edwards called the Inspiris valve. And there's a couple aspects of this that are uh, somewhat unique. So why do biologic valves deteriorate? They deteriorate because of the method of fixation that's used. Uh, and it's all glutaraldehyde fixation. And <clears throat> Not only are, is the tissue prepped that way, but it's stored that way in glutaraldehyde. And that causes free aldehyde radicals uh, on the tissue. 
And those radicals attract calcium. And those calcium bind to aldehydes. So the tissue treatment uh, that Edwards has come up with is called Resilia. And Resilia is a, is a blocking agent that blocks the free aldehydes and prevents calcium deposition from happening on the leaflets. The second benefit of it is that these valves can be dry stored uh, so that there is no washing that's necessary. And, and this technology is being uh, incorporated into TAVR also. So uh, in the animal uh, study, so this is juvenile sheep, uh, which is the standard animal model that predicts calcification of tissue, that the Resilia tissue uh, showed a 72% decrease uh, in calcium uh, content uh, at uh, six months, and, and the effective uh, mean gradient was significantly higher. And, and this shows um, and this shows the uh, resilia tissue on the left and the standard uh, perimount valve on the right uh, at the same period of time, and you can see the calcium deposition uh, happening on the standard surgical valve. So uh, this uh, valve is available now, and, and what we've been uh, trying to do is to how to demonstrate this is really effective in humans without waiting 10 years to determine whether the valves don't deteriorate or not. So there are methods using uh, uh, 4DCT now of looking at microcalcification uh, early uh, and determining whether this really is a better tissue treatment or not. The other benefit of the Inspiris valve uh, is that not only theoretically does it calcify less and can be stored dry, but it has a frackable frame. So in other words, it's designed for subsequent valve and valve uh, where, where that uh, number three is marked on the uh, valve frame there. Uh, it's fracturable at that standpoint, so this valve can be significantly expanded uh, at the time of a subsequent valve and valve. And then the third concept uh, is an aortic annuloplasty ring. Now, why on earth would you want an aortic annuloplasty ring? Well, it's, to, uh, it's for what's called the David procedure, which is aortic valve sparing root replacement uh, uh, done in, with patients with ascending aortic aneurysms um, uh, and that the native leaflets, uh, a native valve can be spared. So the steps of the David operation or a valve sparing root is you excise the aneurysmal ascending aorta and then you place an aortic graft with sinuses uh, uh, present on it uh, 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 over the valve. The valve is then, the native valve is then sewn into the graft uh, and then the coronaries are reattached to it. Well, this is one of the most technically demanded operator dependent operations in cardiac surgery. Uh, and it's why it's only done by a limited number of surgeons in a limited number of centers. Uh, so this idea of creating an annuloplasty ring uh, is to allow this procedure to be more standardized and, and potentially uh, uh, more durable. So this is the concept that the ascending aorta has been excised. This annuloplasty ring is put in uh, at the aortic valve and the valve resuspended on this uh, a stent um, and um, the na own native leaflets are preserved. The greater your degree of aortic insufficiency you have, the less well and less durable uh, patients undergoing a valve sparing root do. And it's thought that this is, the th theory behind this is if you do this, then we can save more valves uh, with aortic insufficiency. So I'll stop there and talk about the remaining aortic innovations in seven minutes after Dr. Holmes gives the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Holmes uh, from the Mayo Clinic. And uh, every, uh, I think all of you know uh, Dr. Holmes very well. He's going to be speaking on uh, tools I wish I had in the cardiac catheterization laboratory for aortic disease. David, welcome. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. Another great meeting. We're going to
talk about mundaneness. Think about that concept of mundaneness as we go forward in this session of new interventions. As we think about sort of new wish th things at Christmas time, we think about puppies and dolls and ponies and trains. And when you have a birthday, you think about money and cars and bikes. And when you have an anniversary, you better be sparkly or chocolate or something like that. Well, I'm going to talk about different things in terms of that wish list. And the unmet clinical needs, when we talk about heart team meetings, at least in Rochester, one of the unmet clinical needs is how exactly do we do patient selection? It seems like a mundane thing, ter not terribly important, except we spend a lot of time with it. You'll remember, of course, the elderly lady from town on whom you did a tavern on, despite the objections of a colleague who felt she was not symptomatic enough. Results have been nothing short of dramatic. There has been immediate improvement in her dyspnea after fatigue and a sense of well-being. In fact, she felt so good she became too active too quickly and fell, sustaining a mild compression fracture of her spine. She is undaunted, however, and is recommending a TAVR to all of her friends. So we then talk about patient selection criteria as an unmet clinical need because there is the issue of frailty versus futility. And we spend a huge amount of time as we see older and older patients. This happens to be one of my patients. I had trained under him and then worked with him. He's a retired physician at the time that I saw him as a patient, hospitalized for respiratory failure, had known severe aortic stenosis. Mean gradient was 41, the aortic valve was 0.83, his ejection fraction was 61% had been referred by then his internist for TAVR. He had pulmonary hypertension, he had coronary disease, he had parenchymal lung disease on chronic oxygen, he had steroid use, he had his STS score of 12, his BMI was 22. He had everything sort of going in the wrong direction. You need to remember that old men with low BMI are really old sick men with low BMIs because they haven't had any nutrition. He had progressive shortness of breath. He wasn't able to walk on a block. He was currently in a wheelchair on oxygen, steroid therapy. He was in a skilled nursing home. He had all the other things that would be bad, but then he then comes to you, and he said, oh, I've known you for a long time, Dr. Holmes. I've got severe aortic stenosis. I've been reading about it. I want a taver. I want a taver. What are you going to do? We've known him for a long time. He's got severe aortic stenosis. Well, the heart team approach is used. I happen to be the cardiologist. I said, well, what about just palliative care, doctor? Not all that well received. Cardiovascular surgeon said, well, maybe TAVR is OK. And so the heart team decision was to temporize with a balloon of valvuloplasty to assess the effect of continued pulmonary rehab. You remember, he's on oxygen. He's had steroids. He's been in the hospital to see whether he might get better in terms of having had a balloon valvuloplasty. And so we did that. We then said, gosh, this isn't the best thing. This, isn't, this is a temporizing thing. He said, no, I, I just need to have that TAVR thing. We said, well, this is, not, this is not the best thing for you. We'll recommend balloon valvuloplasty. And so we had the usual sort of result and improved the gradient from 40 to 30. And we said to the patient, go back and get well, and get well. And so he got well. He had less exertional dyspnea, had less generalized fatigue. He was off of continuous oxygen. He had tapering steroids for his pulmonary disease. And so he had a transfemoral TAVR. And in October of 2017, I Saw him at the end of the year, and he was much improved. He exercises daily, and he said, what have you been waiting for? Why, why did we screw around with this? Why didn't you just give me the tavern that I wanted? So what did we learn? We learned that in a very mundane way, this is mundane stuff, but this is actual practice stuff. Balloon valvuloplasty is a reasonable strategy to assess for symptom improvement. Commitment conditions can affect symptoms out of proportion to aortic stenosis, like he had should be treated aggressively before TAVR decisions are made. So that's the first unmet clinical need. It, it is mundane, but it is real. 
The second issue is, what are we going to do with low flow, low gradient? Found in 5 or 10% of aortic stenosis patients, there's afterload mismatch, cardiomyopathy. The issues are, is it true, the real deal, severe aortic stenosis, or is it sort of pseudo-severe aortic stenosis, not the real thing? So we know that there are subtypes, low gradient, if you have an ejection fraction less than 50%, it can be classical low flow, low gradient. Or if it's greater than 50%, it can be paradoxical low flow, low gradient. Or it can be normal flow, low gradient. Not only can we do procedures and should we do procedures, we need to think about which procedures we should do. And it becomes more complicated because we see those patients that have a preserved ejection fraction, aortic valve area is low, it's indexed to be low, low flow, however. And you have to then be able to understand SVI, terribly important, and that sometimes is not as well understood as it could be. And it can be a mixed bag, it can be a small epentricular cavity with restricted filling, it can be increased arterial afterload, so you give nitroprusside to it to see what it does. There can be guideline inconsistencies. There can be measurement error in terms of the outflow tract. Mundane but terribly important. Or there can be comminent valve lesions because we need to decide whether it's severe aortic stenosis that is critical or whether it's mild aortic stenosis with left ventricular dysfunction. I'll finish then with this case that involves some thinking. We need to be thinkers rather than just doers. 74, patient in Rochester, class 4 heart failure, low flow, low gradient, aortic stenosis, severe functional mitral regurgitation, referred for TAVR. Been referred from another very good institution. He had a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, complete heart block. He had a dual chambered pacemaker. Didn't have any coronary disease. Ejection fraction was 27%. You can see his SVI was 26. His aortic valve area was 0.7 but he did have severe functional mitral regurgitation. His aortic valve mean systolic gradient was 20, but he was felt to have severe aortic stenosis. So we brought him to the catheterization laboratory, to the echo laboratory, wherever you do those things for dobutamine, SVI increased to 34, aortic valve area increased to 0.87, mean gradient sort of bumped up a little bit to 26. Fixed low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis. So you then, as part of the heart team, are going to be asked on Monday morning, or whenever you have that, what are you going to do next? Are you going to say, well, let's go ahead and do TAVR? Maybe you're going to say, well, we're going to do a bloom valvuloplasty. We've done that before. Maybe you're going to do CRT. He already has a dual chambered pacemaker in. His left ventricle is crummy. And he did indeed have an interventricular conduction defect. Or maybe there are other things. And so how are you going to decide that? What are you going to do in a mundane way? In this particular case, the decision was made to say, maybe we should just do TR CRT. So at one month, his New York Heart Association class was two. At nine months, his New York Heart Association class was one. His ejection fraction had gone from 27% to 58% just with CRT, just with CRT, and his aortic valve area was 1.1. Mean gradient was 32, and he now had trivial mitral regurgitation. So the issue of do we need better tools to evaluate concomitant valve disease is incredibly important because CRT has been shown to improve mitral regurgitation, normalize LV in selected patients, and in this specific patient it normalized flow and allowed more accurate assessment of the aortic valve, reclassifying it as moderate, not as severe. And so what do we need from a mundane level? Well, we use dobutamine, we use nitroprusside. But from a mundane level, what we need are better ways to think about things, to do the things that we know we can do, but decide when to do those things that we can do and so our unmet clinical needs are patient selection. How do you assess severity truly? Because we will see patients that have severe disease, moderate disease, and mild disease. We will see patients that have pseudo-severe aortic stenosis, low-gradient aortic stenosis, or paradoxical low 
flow, severe aortic stenosis. The mundane needs indeed are mundane, but they make a huge difference to the practice of TAVR going forward. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for introducing the concept of mundane mundaneness, too. Uh, nothing mundane there for sure. And I feel bad for asking Dr. Mack to come right back to the podium, but uh, Dr. Mack is going to speak on aortic innovations and continue the surgical discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So this is my conflict of interest disclosure. So th uh, three new aortic innovations that you may not know about it. First, I'm going to talk about TVAR for type 1 aortic dissection. Second, the concept of non-biologic polymer non-thrombogenic valves. And third, the concept of endogenous tissue restoration. So the first is TVAR for uh, type 1 aortic dissections, and uh, we see Mike Reardon in the audience here, and I know Mike's got some experience with this and perhaps can comment, but this is kind of the last frontier uh, in uh, TVAR uh, and endovascular treatment of the uh, aorta. And I think we're going to see more and more uh, a TVAR of acute aortic dissections and ascending aortic disease. Uh, and there have even been a number of cases described uh, along with TAVR. Well, there are two endovascular stents that are commonly used. This is all off-label use, uh, the Medtronic Valiant stent and the Cook Zenith stent. And there have been a number of reports over the last couple years, uh, mainly out of England and Cedar sinai and the uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so this is a paper that was uh, published last year of their experience of 22 patients, of which nine had acute type A aortic dissections, uh, nine had ascending aortic pseudoaneurysms with a couple of other diseases here. Uh, the mortality was three patients in this 22, but it definitely proved the uh, feasibility uh, of this uh, uh, treatment of acute type 1 aortic dissection. And this is uh, from that paper showing the aortic dissection uh, on the left and the CT scan three months afterwards uh, uh, showing the endovascular treatment. And this is another case with the acute aortic dissection ahead of time uh, and endovascular treatment afterwards. And there's a number um, uh, of CT scans that shows that uh, this concept uh, of uh, both a TAVR valve and ascending uh, aortic treatment. This is another acute type, uh, uh, type A dissection uh, on the left and post-treatment on the right. Uh, and a number of other cases all showing that this can be successfully done and anecdotal experience that um, it is durable. So this is all off-label use at the current time, and it's being done in high surgical risk patients, uh, and high surgical risk patients that don't present in the middle of the night because logistically getting this uh, uh, all together uh, is somewhat problematic. There are a few physician-initiated IDE trials that are underway uh, in the United States at the current time. Uh, one with Cook and uh, one with Medtronic. And as I've mentioned, there's a few cases of TAVR that have been done with this. So I think we're going to see more and more uh, type A dissections treated uh, uh, with TVAR going forward. The next is non-biologic uh, uh, tissue valves. And perhaps in the uh, discussion, I can ask uh, David Holmes to, um, uh, to talk about this. Uh, this is a concept that has generated in South Africa uh, for treatment of uh, young patients with rheumatic disease uh, that you don't want to put on anticoagulation and you don't want to put a tissue valve in because of the durability issue, especially in, long, in young patients. So this is a surgeon named Peter Zila uh, in South Africa 
that has come up with this concept of using uh, a polymer non-tissue valve uh, <coughs> uh, for the treatment of aortic stenosis uh, um, and insufficiency uh, in young patients. Right now, th this has been done in animals. It's done by a transapical approach. Uh, David just told me before the session started here that clinical trials are starting this summer. Uh, I think this is just the beginning of a brand new area that we're going to see. There are a number of companies that have proprietary polymer technology that is non-thrombogenic. Uh, and I think that these will all be in clinical trials over the next year or so. Uh, and I think we will begin to see moving away from mechanical valves in younger patients and away from biologic tissue valves in younger patients. It, it is the holy grail uh, of valve technology. Coming up with polymers that are non-thrombogenic uh, has been significantly problematic over the last 20 years, but due to advanced uh, 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 polymer technology, it looks like we're finally there. Uh, as I said, there are a number of companies involved with this space, and they're keeping everything confidential under wraps at this stage, but this is probably going to be the first clinical experience in South Africa. And then the third pretty exciting concept is endogenous tissue restoration. So what does that mean? So it's taking a synthetic matrix that's made of bioabsorbable polymers uh, and uh, 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 creating polymer leaflets uh, out of these and then mounting it into a frame. And these polymers attract stem cells within the blood that uh, allows endogenous tissue to grow while the polymer reabsorbs so that you're left with just a native valve and no foreign material at the end of it. It's a, it's a natural, it's a process that is not associated with inflammation, which is what leads to tissue deterioration. So here's the idea, that you implant this scaffold, it attracts neotissue formation to it, and then the scaffold goes away. And, and you can see the graph on the, on the, on the side that you can, uh, as the implant goes away, new tissue is formed. And, and the polymers are so advanced right now that you, can, uh, that you can dial in how rapidly you want the implant to dissolve uh, as new tissue is, um, is formatted. So um, you take the polymers, you uh, add uh, 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 um, uh, uh, chemicals to them that create the flexibility of the scaffold that you want and, and determine the rate of reabsorption of this. Uh, and as, that, as the new tissue uh, is attracted to it, uh, it dissolves. So there are a number of different concepts where this is being used. So there is clinical experience with this already. Uh, in uh, pediatric conduits for the Fontan procedure, uh, and there's two-year results of this at the current time. There is uh, now clinical experience with a pulmonary valve conduit, uh, and um, use in the aortic valve uh, is uh, imminent. There are also a number of other uses of this, uh, and as a conduit for coronary artery bypass grafting, uh, is uh, clearly on, is near on the horizon also. So this is a, a, a human implant uh, of a pulmonary conduit uh, of what this device looks like on the front end and you can see what the valve looks like there. Uh, and then this is uh, animal experiment, uh, experience uh, showing this is what an aortic valve device would look like. Uh, it's been performed in 50 sheep at the current time. There's data out to uh, uh, 12 months now, and there's stable hemodynamic performance without deterioration, with autopsy showing that there is no scaffold remaining uh, and, total, and totally uh, endogenous tissue valves. So in summary, innovation is alive and well in the aortic valve and ascending aorta, and it's not just all about TAVR. And there are numerous alternatives to current tissue valve technology that are on the near horizon, 
either in early clinical studies right now or about to be. Thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, Danny, uh, is Danny here? I know we had a number of flight uh, delays uh, as well. How about uh, uh, Jeff Papma? Oh, hey, Jeff. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Great. So we'll skip over. I think Danny may have been delayed from flights and things, but welcome uh, Dr. Jeff uh, Papma, uh, who's going to be speaking on uh, TAVR experiences uh, that beget innovation. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Paul. This fabulous uh, course. You know, I don't know if you feel this way, but every time I hear Dr. Mack speak about surgery, I think I actually made a career mistake. And is it too late for me? It probably is, right? So the residency and all that kind of stuff. Can I just switch? You can go a surgeon, and I'll become. Uh, I'll take your job as a cardiologist. Okay, that's the deal. I think you're already trained to do that. I think you're already trained to do that. Well, I'm going to move back a little bit to the to the mundane here a little bit, and I had to think about a TAVR experience that really beget intubation. So I'm actually we're going to bring in a case that we actually did a couple of weeks ago, but it's actually got a longer history to that. And that is, you know, when we started to do uh, the core valve, um, self-expanding valve. We were really dealing with data from Europe that suggested that the moderate to severe paravalve regurgitation rate was, was 15 percent, and that was actually probably a good call, a good number. And that's actually obviously way, way too high for what we want to experience now or would be willing to accept. And there were a lot of challenges with the early implantation techniques as we learned about them from our European colleagues. In this particular example, the core valve is functioning well, the gradient's very low, but it's placed about 12 millimeters deep, and there's a substantial amount of regurgitation. It's difficult with this situation to try to pull the valve out. You can do a valve and valve as a, as a bailout technique, but obviously this was the major problem. It was our, big, our biggest concern as we moved to clinical trials in the United States. And I think we learned uh, from the partner data, which had done a little bit earlier, and we certainly had reduplicated this from the, from the uh, self-expanding series, is that moderate to severe paravalvular regurgitation is a big deal. And I think now there's suggestions that, that even mild regurgitation over time in the advanced uh, 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 registry suggested that there may be some implications to that. So obviously the design goal is to eliminate that. Um, very uh, great work by Samir Kapadia got us out of thinking about these, these ordinal rankings of none, mild, moderate, severe, and we can think more clearly about the fact that if you don't have any, it's good, and if you have a lot, it's bad, and then everything else is a little bit of a gray zone in the middle. So our design goal was really to try to move towards reducing regurgitation. So what do we do? Well, as Dr. Reardon, who's here, we brought the core valve in the United States in 2012 for our clinical trials. We thought about a lot of things. <clears throat> we thought about making sure that we had the right size valve, that we had higher implantation technique using the maximum diameter of the self-expanding valve itself. We thought about the hemodynamic assessment that we needed to use with post dilatation, and then we needed to come up with, with better designs. I think one of the take home messages from self expanding technology is that you really need to make sure that you're not undersized. Um, we use the perimeter based diameter, the, when oversizing ratios were over 20%, we had paravalve regurgitation rates uh, with, uh, with the Evolute valve of under 1%. So sizing is key, and I'd still encourage everybody to own the CT process and make sure that you understand the sizing algorithms. Hemodynamics have been controversial about whether we should do them or shouldn't do them with the different valve technologies, and I think that they're still useful and we still do them on a routine basis because one, one needs to understand how much blood is regurgitating from the aorta back down to the ventricle because sometimes the echo doesn't give you a precise evaluation and certainly aortography um, leads much to be desired. So, Technique was important, sizing was important, but we had to come up with better designs. The Evolute design in blue you'll see is shaped differently. It's a little bit oversized compared to the classic core valve. It has more of a vertical um, height to it, so there's better sealing. And then down at the inflow portion, there's actually coverage with the skirt. So the design of the core valve, conformability, oversizing, vertical shoulders allowed us then to have better implantation techniques with less regurgitation. And actually that has held out uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the arena of the Evolute clinical trial. 3.1% at seven days, 5% at 30 days, 3.7% at one year for mild uh, to, moderate to, for moderate to severe. But that, we also had a little bit of deficiency on sizing, so we had to move into the th to a 34 realm, which actually took us up to a 30 diameter. Um, Dan O'Hara has presented this data, 30 days and six months, 
1.7% moderate to severe, and then none at six months. So the 34 valve, which has a 36 millimeter inflow to it, down to a 26 millimeter diameter, it's about oversized by 30%, and at the highest diameter, it still has about a 20% oversizing ratio. So without question, good sealing because it's a large valve, um, a self-expanding valve. Now, on most of our clinical practices now, we're using the Evolute Pro. I never thought this was gonna work. The Evolute Pro was, um, <clears throat> is a pericardial wrap, a tenth of a millimeter in thickness, increases the surface area by about 80% or so, but that increase in surface area does a lot. Um, and now we know that the moderate to severe paravalve regurgitation rates from the Evolute Pro, Pro are essentially uh, non-existent out to one year. And most importantly, 90% of patients had no or trace paravalve regurgitation compared to 11%. So we've really come a long way with paravalve regurgitation. Uh, we've come a long way because uh, it, when we started out in the core valve series with better technique, we were 11%, 3.4% with our uh, Evolute, and now down to very, very low levels with the Evolute Pro. And, and with that, we've also been able to bring down the pacemaker rate because of the conformability of the scaffold and probably the pericardial wrap. But that's not what the case I wanted to show, why we have to big at intervention. I think we've focused in a long way about being able to reduce paravalve regurgitation. And with better designs and better technique, better sizing, we've been able to do that. But this is a case that we did um, at our institution, um, started out about three weeks ago. It was an 80-year-old man, end-stage liver disease, a bicuspid uh, right non-coronary fusion, which is a little bit unusual, not that much calcification of the RAFI. You can see up at the upper, uh, at the, um, uh, at, at between the right and the non-coronary. And we, we had to then figure out how to size. And the perimeter-based diameter was about 88. That would be, if you put that into diameter terms, it's about, about 28. Uh, the sinuses were very big. And one has to ask the question, with, 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 with um, bicuspid disease, do you do annular sizing or does one super annular sizing? And I think a little bit later, if Danny is going to talk, he's going to talk about the basilica technique that actually uh, will actually use a wire and radio frequency to slice the raffi create that to be a tricuspid valve, and, and then allow um, the, the, the self-expanding or, self or, the, or the balloon expandable to form a more circular shape in these bicuspid cases. Uh, this is the calcification that was really within the annulus. Now, unfortunately, I worked really hard with the AV guys. These videos are not going to work, but I want to describe <coughs> what happened. Um, <coughs> this was a 34 implant. Um, it began as an implant depth uh, about uh, 10 millimeters or so. Um, when we um, uh, deployed the valve, it slipped down a little bit further to about 12 to 14 millimeters or so. We did a post dilatation with a true balloon. Things looked better. It was a deep implantation. The mitral valve was not uh, significantly impacted. The, uh, the patient, now, uh, there we go. The patient struggled a little bit. Uh, over about a week or so, developed more severe paravalve regurgitation. And what you can see is the valve has migrated towards the ventricle another couple, three millimeters or so. Um, now, I'm not sure what just happened there. Let's just see if I can get this back up. Nope, I think we're... The uh, laptop. There we go. Yeah, maybe it's the laptop piece. So then we had a deep 34 millimeter implant. It was affecting the valve. There was a lot of leakage and the hemodynamics were bad. The question is, what do you do? Do you at that point in time try to snare the valve and pull it back up? Or do you put another valve in place? And because we were relatively deep, we thought what we'll do with this another 34 valve is place it right at the annulus, which is what we did. Unfortunately, these videos are not going to work. And then we ended up post-dilating it um, and ended up with this morphology of a valve and valve and mild paravalve regurgitation. All right, so a bicuspid valve, large annulus, large valve, a deep implant slipped in had to deal with that issue, came back, now we did a, um, uh, did a valve and valve at the annulus and got a good result and he's actually doing fine now. So we're not done yet with dealing with paravalvular regurgitation and I think that that's gonna lead us to different techniques for bicuspid disease and different uh, uh, types of valves that we'll be using. What is clear for paravalvular regurgitation as a design goal is we've reduced it. Uh, we've been able to do better uh, implantation techniques, we've been able to size better, we've got now PVL rates down to one or two percent. But I have to say that one of our unmet challenges is going to be bicuspid disease. I hope we'll talk a lot about it at this session. It's a different animal. We might have to do different techniques, like slicing the, uh, the, the raffi to allow more circular configuration. We may have to do different sizing techniques, uh, super inner sizing, and potentially use solar valve. But ultimately, I think in the pipeline and soon to be there is we need what we really need in these cases is a fully retrievable and re fully repositionable valve. Uh, thanks for your attention.
Thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs> and thanks for showing that great case, too. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Will Anderson, uh, who's going to be speaking on uh, ongoing clinical trials uh, we can't wait for. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be with you this morning. Let me tee this up here. So it's, uh, it's interesting that I'm the person giving this talk for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the, uh, an assessment of what's going on in the clinical space at the moment uh, with the panel that sits before you and with some of the folks in the audience. But I think I can give you some, some uh, assessment of what's going on and what the interesting questions are in the TAVI space at the moment. I don't have any disclosures for this, uh, for this talk. If we can get the slides to advance, we'll be good. There we go. So maybe we could rephrase the, the title to something about interesting questions in TAVI, because that's, that's really what we would like to talk about in terms of, of the results that we really can't wait for. So we could talk about new valves in the marketplace. We're going to have a new valve in the US in the coming year. We've had a long-standing discussion about durability. I think that discussion is going to come into clearer focus uh, with some of the trials that I'll describe to you. It's interesting, we could talk about the economics of transcatheter valves. Remember, we're talking about taking, as TAVR it, it takes over more of the landscape, we're taking high net contribution margin cases off the table, literally out of the operating room, putting them in the cath lab or the hybrid OR, and that's something that, uh, as, as healthcare systems, we're going to have to be able to deal with. Reducing complications, this is a tried and true topic of conversation. Jeff was just talking about it in terms of PVL, but we're interested in stroke rates. Uh, we saw the Sentinel device earlier and uh, in pacemaker rates as well. And it's interesting, now that we're getting into uh, a different landscape where we have more devices that are accessible, we're actually on the cusp of being able to do, I think, a lot of things with multivalvular disease. So with that in mind, let me just give you a few takeaways from what's going on in the investigative world. Low surgical risk is, is definitely on the front burner. We'll be getting some interesting reports from, from Dr. Mack's partner trial and the Medtronic low risk trial uh, that Dr. Reardon is involved in. Um, Medtronic low risk is STS of less than three. Um, it is about 1,200 patients and with long-term follow-up. Similarly, partner three is about 1,200 patients, uh, all transfemoral sapiens with 10-year follow-up, and that's an STS of less than four. So these are really low risk trials. UK TAVI trial is a little different. It's more of an all-comers trial looking at uh, all available transcatheter valves in UK uh, and all access points. Um, that is a, a trial that has uh, about 800 or 900 patients in it, and I think it will be some time before we get results of this study. Notion 2 is another interesting trial, about 1,000 patients. Again, it's all valves but only transfemoral access, uh, and, that is, and those are patients who have an STS less than 4 and are uh, under the age of 75. So we're really heading towards a much lower risk landscape with younger patients where valve durability is going to come into play. So in these four trials combined, we have about 4,000 randomized patients. Uh, between them, five to 10 years of follow-up. And the vast majority of these patients will see an STS less than uh, four or less. And we're expecting reports from partner and Medtronic low risk at the next ACC meeting in the spring. So what do we hope these trials will tell us? It's interesting, you know, the, when we get the primary endpoints of these trials, partner uh, is a one-year endpoint and Medtronic low risk is a two-year endpoint. Uh, that's not necessarily the, the most compelling part of the story to me. I think the most interesting parts of this will be the longer-term mortality. 
I think this data set will finally allow us to stop borrowing so heavily from the surgical valve literature when we talk to patients about long-term du durability issues. Um, and I think that we'll also gain some understanding of what structural valve deterioration looks like over the long term. In other words, how will these valves fail? We know they will fail. It's an issue of time. Um, will it be structural valve deterioration? Will it be non-structural valve deterioration in terms of patient prosthesis mismatch or PVL? Thrombosis endocarditis, I think, uh, certainly endocarditis will be a relatively, we hope, a relatively minor player in that scheme. Thrombosis, though, may not be. So the longer term uh, and long term imaging of these valves, I think, give us a, a much greater database to look at long term issues. Uh, Jeff showed you some interesting data on uh, minor PVL, which has been uh, and, and Samir has, has published on that as well. What will mild PVL look like over a 10-year follow-up period of time? We don't know that at the moment. I think we'll also get some interesting looks at what the long-term risks of thromboembolic events are, what's the long-term issues surrounding pacemaker implantation in this patient population. I think another topic that we should probably include in this is looking at earlier and more aggressive intervention with transcatheter valves. The early TAVR trial has started. Uh, it's based on the premise that uh, we can mechanically unload the ventricle with or without in the absence of symptoms. So there's a very high prevalence of severe aortic stenosis patients. If you start dredging your echo databases, you'll find severe aortic stenosis patients who, uh, who do not have symptoms. Um, and the question would be, if we intervene earlier in them, can we prevent end organ damage? There's some retrospective data. This I'm, I'm showing you a, um, a long-term follow-up from uh, a number of trials showing that, at least with surgical aortic valve replacement, there may be a signal that uh, we have improvement in a combined endpoint. So it's, it's, this is not just mortality. It's uh, rehospitalization, et cetera. This has led to the early TAVR trial. Um, we're focusing on patients with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. They have to go through a, a screening stress test. For those patients who can't undergo that stress test, it's, it's uh, medical history only, which I think may add some variability to the patient population, but it's a one-to-one -one randomization to transfemoral TAVI versus the usual clinical surveillance and so to your composite endpoint that you see before you. We're way, we've been, we've started enrollment in that trial, uh, but it should be some time before we have results. We are also looking at earlier intervention in patients with moderate aortic stenosis and left ventricular dysfunction. These two issues, the issue of aortic stenosis and heart failure and LV dysfunction, co-mingle significantly in an elderly patient population, as you know, uh, clearly, we understand that heart failure patients have an impaired quality of life and increased mortality, and the goal of medical therapy is to unload the ventricle. The question would be, can we mechanically unload the ventricle in these patients and achieve some beneficial effect? If you look retrospectively at patient populations, this is from, from uh, four academic institutions, a, um, a follow-up study looking at, a rather a retrospective study, looking at death AVR or heart failure hospitalization. You can see, I don't know if you actually can see that very well, but at four years, it's a, the primary endpoint was 60%. So uh, this is a patient population that has uh, a relatively poor prognosis, and we hope that by intervening early, uh, we may be able to improve their prognosis. So the TAVR unload trial is underway. It's 600 patients that are equally, uh, or rather randomized one-to-one -to, -one to TAVR versus uh, medical therapy alone, and the primary endpoint is what you can see there, all-cause mortality, disabling stroke, and essentially cardiovascular hospitalization. I think the last major topic that I'd like to address with you is the issue of anticoagulant therapy after transcatheter valves. Anticoagulant therapy, uh, is, um, is an interesting landscape. We, we've used dual antiplatelet therapy because it was involved in all the 
pivotal clinical trials. Uh, our understanding of the pathophysiology of any of this is, is relatively meager. So we'd like to maintain valve function. We are clearly aware that, that valve thrombus is a problem, both in transcatheter valves and surgically implanted valves. Uh, so we want to maintain valve function and avoid thrombus. We also want to prevent thromboembolic events. We really don't understand whether this is necessarily a platelet-mediated problem or a thrombin-mediated problem. Together with these issues, we also have the underlying comorbidities of the patient population we're frequently dealing with. They, there's a high prevalence, as you know, of coronary disease and heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So a lot of these patients have other needs from a thrombosis standpoint. It's also a patient population that has a relatively high bleeding risk. So if you look at this, it's, it's a relatively complicated landscape in terms of what, the, what these trials look like. Uh, some of the trials that you see before you have been completed, ART, for instance, has been completed, looking at aspirin monotherapy versus dual antiplatelet therapy, suggesting that aspirin monotherapy actually may be better. I draw your attention to popular TAVI, popular. Uh, um, this is a safety trial looking at aspirin uh, versus dual antiplatelet therapy in patients who do not have any indication for oral anticoagulation. And in those who do, looking at a combined therapy of Plavix and a vitamin K antagonist versus vitamin K antagonist alone. I think the other, and frankly, I think more interesting trials uh, would be Galileo and Atlantis. Galileo is a little, a little ahead looking at rivaroxaban uh, with aspirin versus dual antiplatelet alone. Uh, this trial is, I think, a well positioned for us to be able to look at valve thrombosis over a significant period of time. And uh, we should be getting those results, I think, in 19. So uh, that is something to look forward to. The Atlantis trial uh, is a little further behind, and it involves Eliquis uh, versus aspirin or, or dual antiplatelet therapy. So in conclusion, I'd say we're clearly reaching into lower risk and younger patient cohorts uh, to investigate really mainly the durability of transcatheter valves and longer term outcomes. If we have reasonable durability in these patient populations, look, we know we have a larger EOA uh, and, and lower gradients over time. That was something that, that came out of the Notion 1 trial uh, and, and, and other trials, frankly. Um, so I think it will be interesting to see what our, what our endpoints look like in this younger patient cohort. The early intervention with TAVI may benefit certain subgroups that we haven't really looked at before, uh, specifically related to LV unloading. And those would be patients who are asymptomatic or those who have left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure. And lastly, uh, I think we'll learn a lot about what antiplatelet and anticoagulant strategies and combinations thereof uh, may give patients the best long-term outcome with freedom from valve thrombosis and thromboembolic events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, we are a little bit uh, behind here. If I could just ask the remaining speakers just to try to keep it uh, within seven minutes if possible, that would be great. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Mohan Murbrada, who comes from the Cleveland Clinic, and he's going to give us an interesting perspective because he's in charge of the product development there as a senior director. So, Mohani, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suraja. Thank you for the invitation. Let's see. I'm trying to find my slides here. Escape. Oh, escape. Sorry. Yeah, here we go. Perfect. So this is a non-clinical talk, so definitely a break maybe in between uh, discussions. So I have nothing to disclose for this particular talk, and uh, let's see what's next. Perfect. So uh, I'm, my mission today is to provide you with the perspective on, from uh, the VC, from Venture Capitalist. This is a business perspective on the aortic valve uh, space. Uh, again, my name is Marwan Barada, and I'm a senior director at the Cleveland Clinic. To provide you that perspective, I think I want to take you a little bit down the memory lane and talk about the history around TAVR. So Dr. Alan Crivier did, a, obviously, with his uh, um, passion around valves, brought up a field to us, which is the percutaneous valve. 
I ho also we need to give credit to Edwards and Medtronic. They acquired companies, early stage companies, they were able to nurture both on the clinical side and the financial side to provide us with devices that we use in today. And this is all about the investment uh, that we want to talk about in the VC perspective. With that, people have seen the opportunities and many different valves have been created. Um, and a question from, a, from an investor is, well, out of all of these valves, how many will see the day of light? Um, a light of the day, sorry. And then how many of those will actually be investable or not? And that's the discussion that we're going to have today. So from the aortic valve space characteristics, it's definitely a disruptive technology. It has a very similar outcome than the, than the, the, the surgical. So this, this procedure here to stay, and we know that, and we heard it multiple times. It is a very significant large market. The indications have been expanding from high-risk patients towards low-risk patients with very uh, good data. There's a significant technical improvement from all of these devices from generation to generations, and every speaker here has been talking about that evolution and how that actually impacted. And every strategic today has a, has a type of program. So it's not a surprise to us that this is a very large market. In 2020, it's actually projected to be over $2 billion in revenues, just only the TAVR. We have not talked about mitral valve or other type of valve. So this is a very significant market. This is the data that we collected internal to the Cleveland Clinic Business Intelligence. We actually counted about 27 aortic valve uh, companies. Out of those, about eight have been acquired, three have been defunct, and 14 are still active. The St. Jude slash Abbott portico valve is an internal uh, development. We totaled about over $720 million in investment and over $2 billion of return, which is an ROI return on investment of about six times. This is a very significant and very healthy. So what's uh, left for us to improve? We talked about stroke rate. It needs to be reduced. We talked about paravalvular leakage, coronary obstructions, heart block, uh, reduction in heart block and conduction disturbance. And we talked about leaflet durability for low-risk patients. But I would like to argue that these are all marginal improvements and they're not disruptive enough to actually warrant investment. So we talk about all of these, but if from an investor perspective, this is very difficult for uh, somebody new to build a company around solving these problems alone because they have to borrow technologies, they have to borrow current devices, and at best what they will get is license to a strategic rather than actually an acquisition. So what is left for us to see here from an investment perspective and what are the new, um, new uh, roads that we can actually take? From an investment, we, we first ask the question, if I build it, will they come? So it's very important for us to have an understanding who would be the potential acquirer. If we build today an aortic valve um, uh, business or a company, will Edwards come? Will Medtronic, Boston Scientific, or somebody else? So we need to have that ability to answer the que that question. It has to obviously resolve a large unmet need, and it has to have a large market as well. So also the characteristics of the competitions and the landscape of uh, the technical landscapes are very important. As we talked about, there are 14 active uh, TAVR companies today. So am I going to be the 15th, the 16th? Am I going to make actually an impact into this field if I'm that late in, in the, uh, as an entry? So the, the barrier of entry is also very uh, important to us, and also switching costs. So today we talk about self-expanding versus balloon expandable. So if somebody is trained toward balloon expandable, how am I going to drive a training program so I can actually switch that user operator from balloon expandable to self-expanding. And lastly, if I'm a late entrant, how am I going to compete? If I'm early, how much money do I need to actually educate the space? So here's where we stand today. Most of the strategics have a valve, whether self-expandable or balloon expandable. So the first question that we ask ourselves, so at least from a, from a VC perspective, is is there any more product differentiation or are we moving towards a cost adventure strategy in which now to actually gain market sharing among these companies, you have to actually reduce the cost? That's, we don't have an answer, but it's definitely a question on the table. And how about the rest? Are other companies will come in? And if they come in, how will they disturb the market? So my interest here in the aortic space actually four folds. Um, aortic repaired for aortic stenosis. I want to address a little bit of aortic regurgitation. We haven't heard a lot of people talk about it. Uh, some leaflet engineering and then um, TAVR outcome prediction and patient stratification we've talked about earlier. <clears throat> in 
in aortic repair, very out of the box thinking. Picard is doing a pretty good job at uh, uh, pushing the, this invention. It's still an evaluation and the approach is very intriguing. Can we do one day aortic repair to help our patient? Aortic regurgitation, we started dabbling into this. We started using our current devices actually in the aortic regurgitation uh, patient. However, they have a different etiology. If you look at the valve itself, there's no calcium. There's no way for us to be able to, to, to line up our devices. There's no, no way for us to have those devices uh, grab onto something. There's no, no calcium. So is this a good opportunity for the field to go design new devices? The inner valve, as an example, has a foray into this. And we're very interested to, to hear what they're gonna be um, coming up as far as clinical results. Aortic regurgitation prevalence is very similar to aortic stenosis, so why don't we go into it as perhaps uh, a field? And obviously you can see here, that patients don't do well when they have a, a high uh, classification. <clears throat> this is, uh, as a, it was a surprise to me, Dr. Mack and I, we did not communicate before this, <laughs> and then we had the same idea, so Exceltis. Absolutely. You explained, uh, it was explained to us how it worked. For us, this is very, very exciting. This company has raised, 40, has raised 45 million euros. They're actually in Netherlands. They're thinking about coming to the U.S., and, and this is going to be very interesting to see how this will pan out. In the same vein, so this is uh, another tissue, uh, polymeric tissue. This is actually a polymer that is coated with HA. And as you can see from those images, it has a very good properties for actually the, reducing the adherence of platelets on, on the tissue. What's interesting about this valve here is the ability of this valve to heat set, meaning that it don't have to have stitches to be able to shape it up. So with nine stitches on the valve, you can actually have exactly a similar uh, configuration as a, as a sapient valve. This is a balloon expandable valve. You can see the time to manufacture it, the cost, and what's exciting about this is actually they have the ability to go down to a 12 French. Very exciting work. So you can see here, this is a preclinical. Um, and then on a bench testing, you can see that this valve is actually the one, the top one is very comparable to a sapien valve. This is phenomenal. If we can do this, I think that would be, that would be great for the field. Lastly, to have our outcome prediction. So it's, this is again from the same group. So from the top, let's see here. So from the top here, you see that this patient has gotten uh, a core valve had massive uh, paravalvular leakage. They took the same data and then modeled around, around this as, as a tool, and then they have shown that actually with a, you know, the, the patient should have gotten Edwards valve rather than actually a core valve. They were all able to predict what would be the best valve for this type of anatomy. Below, you can see again valve placement. In this particular case, they were able to see what would be the best height for the placement of the sapien valve to prevent any coronary ostium occlusion. In conclusion, know the game and who's the potential acquirer. In aortic, in aortic stenosis, the Tavir product differentiation is subsiding, so what's next for us? Um, again, new upcoming technologies may be more robust solutions for AS and AR, so are we gonna be looking at a new field emerging out of the aortic regurgitation with new valve? So with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Adam Greenbaum uh, as our next speaker. As many of you know, Adam has been a real pioneer uh, in um, cautery techniques, various ways to deliver valves in, in different ways, and certainly is a, uh, what's that? Oh, okay. Yeah. And welcome, Adam. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thank you, Samir. I may know how to do TAVR, but I clearly don't know how to do, um, get slides up here, so um, you have to give me a second here. I wasn't really sure what you really wanted me to talk about. And since you left it up in the air, uh, you're going to get the world according to Greenbaum. Or <laughs> should I say Garp or Greenbaum? I don't really. Um, do I use this um, forward thing here? Or do I just press the button here? Let's see what's going on. We there? OK. Here are my disclosures. So where are we right now in 2018? This is the way I look at it. Tavra's pretty good. Right? We've taken the guesswork out of imaging, predictable deployment, 
the techniques, you know, a little caudal here or there, high deployment, pretty refined. It's pretty rare that something really bad happens. Stroke seems to be getting better without, with cerebral protection, but even without it. And bad perivalvular leak seems pretty much under control too, with the exception of maybe some rare subtypes. So what's left or where do I think we can optimize TAVR in 2018? These are the things that I think we ought to think about. The invasiveness of the procedure, certain subtypes, and uh, patient prosthesis mismatch for valve and valve. So let, let's start with invasiveness. When I was learning to do TAVR in 2012, putting everyone to sleep, TEEs, mandated cutdowns to the groin by Edwards, my new partner, Vasilis, was already had this thing down to a calf. <laughs> And uh, so the goal with this minimalist TAVR thing is make it simple and at least maintain, but possibly actually improve outcomes. And of course, reduce cost. Now, everybody here knows who's probably a good candidate for a straightforward minimalist TAVR, right? Think about it, you know. There wouldn't be a hard intubation. You know, they can cooperate with you. They're likely to get up and move around. So, so there's well, well um, already described uh, algorithms for this. And certainly it's gonna save you money, right? Because you're eliminating half the stuff that you do during the procedure. But more importantly, the outcomes are certainly no worse. They may not have proven yet to be better, but certainly no worse. But actually as time has gone on in 2017, uh, Vasilis looked at their thousand patients with this approach and as the newer generation valves come out, outcomes are getting better and better. So the way I look at it, uh, it wouldn't be hard to think that Outcomes may actually get better by doing less. Same thing with discharging them on the next day. It doesn't appear to be when you look at the data that outcomes are any worse. So for optimizing TAVR, number one, nothing good happens to anybody in the hospital. That's what I always say. So stop the innovation, stop the general anesthesia. Don't put a nine French, 12 French sheath in the neck. We don't do A-lines anymore, no bladder catheters, no ICU, get them out of bed and get them home the next day. Number two. What about the people who you can't do a standard transfemoral? Used to be TA and TAO sort of ruled the world. But every paper shows that outcomes appear to be worse. In the real world, if you propensity match these people, and actually you can't even show that alternative intrathoracic access is actually better than full surgery. There's been no data to actually show that yet. So on the other hand, if you push the transfemoral, for people who don't have good access, bad things happen also. So of course there's this cadre of alternative access for those with poor vessels. Well, let's look at some of these. There's good data now, 200 patients from the core valve registry. Subsurgical subclavian looks pretty similar to transfemoral outcomes. We did a 100 patient study with transcaval access, bleeding almost the same as standard transfemoral. We looked at our own carotid access did just as well as our own transfemorals. And actually, one of my new partners, Dr. Deveretti, has now started using the uh, shockwave lithotripsy balloon to actually improve delivery of standard transfemoral access for people that you wouldn't normally get the catheter up. Things have moved to percutaneous transaxillary, less data, but certainly been shown feasible as an alternative as well. So number two, you want to optimize TAVR in 2018, if you have poor iliofemoral anatomy, pick one of these, but get out of the chest. How about the coronary obstruction risk? You know, it is rare, but there's a, if you think about how many times you've put a wire down just in case, it certainly can happen. There's certain predisposing factors. And even though it's rare, the fact of the matter is, it's pretty bad outcomes if it happens. Even if you get the vessels open, these people all go into shock, and despite a high PCI success rate, forget it if you're not successful, they all die. But even if you're successful, there's a high mortality rate. And it's complicated knowing who's going to obstruct and who's not going to obstruct. The conventional way to do this by putting a stent down and then deploying it if necessary may be simple, but it's not very elegant because it's aspen and plavix for life. Sometimes you can't get the stent out. You have to chimney it a long way. And sometimes the occlusion occurs late. So third point, innovation for optimizing TAVR. For those of you who don't know Basilica, this is a novel transcatheter technique to minimize the risk of coronary obstruction developed by Jaffer Khan and Robert Letterman at the NIH. 
where we modified lampoon, which we were doing for mitral valves, to now split the leaflet of the corner of the indwelling by a prosthetic valve or the native valve to get the leaflets out of the way. Dr. Mack will tell you, right? They take out the whole valve. They don't, they don't have this problem. But we can do something similar to get the leaflets out of the way to prevent coronary obstruction. Here's a case that I did early on, a mitral flow that clearly would have obstructed. You can see that leaflet in the way. Here's what it looks like angiographically. Burn through the leaflet. Echocardiographically, you can see the bubbles and the burn through the left leaflet. Create the lasso and slice the leaflet. Here's what the split leaflet looks like. You've made it a quadricusp leaflet. Do you see it right in front of the left main? There's a beautiful split leaflet still working. And here, after valve deployment, no leaflet in the way anymore. So for number three, I think there are techniques you can do for those anatomic subtypes. So basilica, to me, is a more elegant way to address the problem itself. You could fracture if you want. Your future use future availability to get into the coronaries for work. As of June, it had been done in almost 50 patients out. Now we're probably over 60. The IDE trial is almost done enrolling. 27 of 30 are already enrolled. And in April of this year, actually, uh, Drs. Khan, Letterman, Babaleros, and I actually used this to circulate a bicuspid valve prior to implantation of valve. There was a patient at risk of coronary obstruction and severe eccentricity of the valve. We actually burned through, not the rafe itself, but the true leaflet, and then got beautiful symmetric deployment of the TAVR valve with bisilica, a modification of basilica for bicuspid valve. So that's already been done. Hopefully that will be published soon. So in summary, these are the things that you can do to optimize TAVR in 2008. Make it as least invasive as possible and get these patients home. Make it the most transfemoral-like. Learn some of these techniques to address those certain coronary and other anatomic conditions. And then, actually, I don't know what happened to the slide, but I think balloon valve fracturing during valve and valve taver to increase, patient, to increase and improve on the patient prosthesis mismatch are all where I think we should be in 2018. Thank you very much. Love of bisilica, that's fantastic. So our, our final, uh, uh, but not least, uh, speaker, Dr. Joao Cavacante, uh, who uh, is um, going to be talking to us on uh, CT imaging for TAVR, uh, beyond area and perimeter. Joao, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Paul, for a phenomenal meeting. And ladies and gentlemen, an honor to be here representing still the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, going to be joining my partner here, uh, Paul, in a couple of months and really excited about that. And so the next seven minutes, I will hope to cover you some aspects about CT. And then an interesting story here, if Adam remembers, in, Seattle, in uh, San Francisco at TCT, we crossed each other in the hall. He said, what are you doing here? I thought that you were doing imaging. I said, well, but, you know, you guys need us, right? And he said, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. So, you know, with the imaging aspect, we have learned quite a lot. CT has definitely established itself as a method to really size and predict better outcomes. And we take it for granted what we do today on a routine basis. But if you remember, recall, we used to do a lot of autographies, try to find the perfect angle until we said, hey, we can do this with CT. We can predict the angle of the implant. And by doing that, we're going to reduce procedural time. We're going to reduce contrast media, radiation, and many other things. And that's how it established itself. Can do the same automatically, but we could do that also manually. You just have to bisect the right coronary cusp. I was very interested to hear by Dr. Capati as well that we can should consider the IO caudal as well as another method to make sure that we are completely coplanar to the angle of implant, and by doing so, hopefully reduce pacemaker needs. Another aspect talking about angle is also looking at the aortic root angulation. We look at the corona projection here, we have two different patients. One that has a very obtuse angle of angulation, more than 48 here, and this angle is defined by the aortic annulus versus the horizontal plane. And the authors here by the group from Cedar Sinai have found that an angle greater than 48 has been associated with a greater uh, risk of a post dilation, less device success, more paravalve leak, and a trend towards more pacemaking implantation on self expanding valves. 
But perhaps in face of that, one could consider a different valve choice here, and it has to do with the workability and the controlling of the steering guide with the self-expanding platform. The issue about the pacemaker is not trivial. I know that this is a small uh, peanuts in the big scheme of investment for a financial investor, but you know, for a patient that we deal with this, we can almost predict five, 10 years from now, they're going to have tricuspid regurgitation. Some of them might have device implants, and we don't know, quite honestly, what is the long-term impact of being RV paced and creating the synchrony over time. And this has to do with not only predisposing factors such as right the bundle branch block, which obviously increases the risk, prosthesis depth, but obviously the membrane septum uh, length. Obviously this is uh, just one measurement and this work by Hamdan has shown that if you have a shorter membrane septum, and they saw the, here this cutoff of about eight millimeters was associated with a higher likelihood of a pacemaker implantation. This is a case that we had, as you can see this short the septum was quite short at five millimeters, prosthesis depth was lower than ideal, and patient ended up with a pacemaker. So we need to refine better, have a better angulation, and have a better perspective on where to deploy an implant high. Now going into the valve itself, also calcification plays a role, not only for annular rupture, for balloon expandable, paravalvular leak, as you heard before, but also for potential pacemaker need. This non-coronary cusp calcification seems to be a very vulnerable area causes the locus minoris, the area where there's no support other than fat. So perforation there can really choose some very bad and, and um, also pressure into the AV node. So the device landing zone calcification, which drapes down from the non-coronary cusp into the non-coronary cusp, has been associated with a better prediction of pacemaker needs. This other interesting study that came out in the European Heart Journal a couple years ago is another concept of the calcification, not only at the non-coronary cusp, but also at the last coronary cusp might be important. Let me take you through this slide. So we know that right bundle branch block is associated with pacemaker risk, but in patients that have a higher calcification of the left coronary cusp, this valve would not center properly. So here we have two patients, non-calcified cusp, non-coronary cusp calcified, left coronary cusp, less calcified. The valve assumes a more centric approach because the left coronary cusp can give in. When you have calcification of the left coronary cusp, on the other hand, the valve is gonna sit somewhat asymmetric and therefore pressure more into that AV node and therefore create a high risk for pacemaker. Now taking from pacemaker risk to obviously the diagnosis, as you, had, as you heard from Dr. Holmes, the issue about low gradient aortic stenosis is not trivial. We face these patients frequently in our lab, but I would argue almost about 25, 30% if you don't take this low flow. But low gradient aortic stenosis exists. And we scratch our heads. Do these patients really have severe aortic stenosis or not? Because that's how we, uh, how we currently treat these patients. One method to use is the calcium score. You use a non-contrast CT scan, similar to what we do for coronary calcium score, and one can measure that calcium. There's a gender differences here. It's a gender specific. Women tend to have less calcium than men for the same degree of aortic stenosis. Cutoffs are around 1,300 for women and about 2,000 for men. We're glad to participate in this large registry multicentric from the folks also in Canada and Scotland in showing that these values are reproducible. And actually each center measure its own calcium score and we came up with exactly the same numbers. So women has less calcium than men and these values should be taken seriously and is a flow independent measurement. So we don't need to do the butamine for these patients. And take it finally, integrating all these values is also, as you heard before from prior speakers, using a patient-specific computer simulation model. Perhaps with that, we could then perhaps uh, identify what is the best location? What is the interplay of the native calcium with the valve deployment for paravalvular, uh, paravalvular prediction as well as for pacemaker prediction? Not only a single measurement is going to be enough, and we need to learn better. So in conclusions, Patient device selection continues to evolve, as you heard. CT can provide several aspects of the how to best deliver, and it's better to be prepared and anticipate complications than trying to mitigate them when they happen. Patient-specific simulations might be a small niche for selected patients, and cutoff values should be interpreted as a spectrum. Obviously, an angle greater than 48 is no different than an angle of 46. This is not a dichotomania that is going to be, this patient is going to do well, this patient is not going to do well, but we have to integrate the whole picture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joao. So uh, Dr. Mack was just commenting, we've learned about uh, dichotomania and also mundaneness. Uh, so, 
Um, we are considerably over, but if I could take just two minutes, just uh, any questions for the panel at all? I do have one question for Samir. So, I, Samir, you're heavily involved in the Sentinel study. Do you do it in everybody? Is there anybody who's not a candidate, and how do you choose? So, I, we use it in everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, tortuous, non-tortuous, calcified, except for the size. If the size is true or large, still these days I use it, even partial protection, better than even none. Yeah. So in the last six months, we used in everybody. Uh, and if the radial artery is not there, I don't like to stick the brachial. Mm -hmm. But I would recanalize the radial if possible, so I just stick it and go in. So everybody. Fantastic. So uh, could I ask David Holmes, about what you learned in South Africa about uh, polymer uh, valves and the idea of um, non-thrombogenicity? Sure, um, the, the important part of that comes from the societal need in South Africa. In South Africa, there are um, at most 45 cardiovascular surgeons um, in a country of 55 million people. There are only 170 cardiologists in a country of 55 million people. That's the first couple pieces of information. Second piece of information is that they have a huge amount of structural heart disease. Some of it is old rheumatic stuff or new rheumatic stuff. Um, and they then are faced with having to take care of these patients when they go back to tribal areas don't have very much support. And so there has been an initiative by Peter Zilla, who works at the same place that Christian Bernard did, to develop a new strategy to take care of those patients. So they have come up with a couple of different things. They've come up with a polymer that's similar to what has been uh, talked about um, that looks like it lasts maybe not forever, but for a really long time. It doesn't degenerate, and it doesn't develop thrombus on it. Number two. Um, because it does, does not develop thrombus on it, it does not require anticoagulation. Um, number three, because much of their disease is bicuspid disease um, and doesn't have as much calcification, in part because they're younger patients, they haven't had time to calcify, they're looking for some ways to indeed um, identify the, the best place to put this valve. And so they have a unique structure that allows it to self-center. And number four, in terms of taking care of that broad group of patients, not only in South Africa, but all of sub-Saharan um, Africa, um, they are talking about bringing this technology along so that it would be able to be used transapically, similar to what the surgeons would have known about in terms of old Tubbs dilators, um, that it was relatively easy to do, you didn't necessarily need all of the fancy, sophisticated equipment to do that, but you took care of a clinical problem. They are starting the trials now, as of this summer, at least that's what he told us earlier this year. The question is, would that be something that would really be an unmet clinical need in this country? And so we're then beginning to try to talk with them about that as a possibility. It's tremendously exciting. This stuff is really cool. David, uh, it would seem to me that a huge need for that area is rheumatic mitral. Uh, I mean, are they developing it for the mitral as well? They are. No. They are, and that would be obviously much more similar to the Tubbs dilator <laughs> yeah. approach. Yeah. And David, am I remembering correctly that the goal of this is to be a $500 valve? Yes. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Well, on that note, uh, we'll conclude there. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>